professor at Berkeley for some 30 years, a substantial part of which he was a professor of astronomy. Returned to the UK in 1999 to take up the civilian chair at the University of Oxford. <coughs> He's currently professor of physics at the Institut d'Astrophysique de Paris, University Pierre et Marie Curie, home of professor of physics and astronomy at the Johns Hopkins University, and professor of astronomy at Gresham College. He conducted early important work on the CMB, and particularly on how the observed structure of the fluctuations in the radiation reflect the physics of acoustic oscillations and diffusion damping, the latter of which is referred to as silk damping. It's a pleasure to introduce Joe, who will speak this morning about inflationary predictions of cosmology. Thank you, Tony, and um, thank you, Grass, also, for that nice introduction to cosmology, and um, it's a pleasure to be here. Okay, so let me, um, I'm going to begin with a little bit of history, perhaps, because um, I'm going to address um, the question of um, inflation and what predictions it has made um, so that we can test this uh, rather um, amazing theory of the beginning of the universe. And um, so let me begin with um, going back to 1933. So this was um, 85 years ago. And this is truly amazing. Lemaitre, who is um, one of the fathers of Big Bang cosmology, um, wrote a paper in which he interpreted the cosmic constant as pressure equals minus rho c squared. So this is the equation of state that we live with today. It means there are vacuum fluctuations. Um, that's one's interpretation of this, and he, he says this too. Um, uh, and he foresaw all of this um, 85 years ago. Quite amazing. Um, and, of course, there was no evidence. And at the time, here's an example of the reaction he got. Um, Lemaitre's hypothesis is the wildest speculation of all, an example of speculation run mad without a shred of evidence to support it. And um, you're going to hear similar remarks being made, possibly about inflation, I expect. You can find them in the literature. But let me... Um, so historically, it's wonderful to see this, but of course, what changed everything was evidence. And so this was <coughs> the new thing that really uh, changed everyone's views on the subject. Distant supernovae were found to be significantly too faint um, by roughly 20%, which is an enormous amount, because we understand them well enough to think that, well, they, it's hard to think of a physical explanation and so acceleration, they're certainly just further away than they would be in a uniform expanding universe. That did the job very nicely. And that, of course, led us to um, the accelerating universe that we, uh, many of us, um, know only too well, and some of us love, others hate. Okay, so um, again, summary of um, all the, date, the data to date. Um, this is the expansion law of the universe uh, going further and further away. And um, what you can begin to see are deviations from uniform expansion. And this is the acceleration uh, beginning at redshifts of order um, 0.5 or so, half the, the significant fraction of the, of the observable universe. Um, and it's remarkable, all of this came from the modern data. But in the early days, when the expansion was discovered, we had both Hubble and Lemaitre writing pioneering papers. Um, Lemaitre had these set of models, you know, which allowed expanding universes forever accelerating, ones which collapse, and we eventually settled on one with expand forever. But it's interesting to look at their data, Hubble's data from 1929. We named the expansion law after him. But amazingly, two years before, Lemaitre published this paper. He'd spent some time at Caltech. And he uh, had acquired the data from indirectly from people then, from people like Slipher, and he, he realized the same fit to his models. Um, we should probably call this the Hubble Lemaitre law of the expanding universe. Okay, so that was um, the story then um, that sets up modern cosmology. So now let's focus on the cosmic microwave background, which is the one of the prime primary themes of this workshop today. Um, and so the story is that it was discovered um, uh, uh, in 1964 by Penzias and Wilson. They just measured one frequency, 
and inferred cosmic black body radiation. And quite amazingly, um, it took a couple of decades, but with the uh, COBE satellite, one measured this amazing um, uh, spectrum of black body radiation with the fire spectrometer. Um, these are 400 sigma error bars, hard to believe, one of the most perfect black bodies ever, ever seen, um, telling us the universe at the beginning was a perfect furnace. And we're looking now at the cooled down relic of that radiation. Um, and so the next step in this is to say, well, that's fine, wonderful, but the universe is full of structure, full of galaxies. And these galaxies um, must have begun, we think, from smaller density fluctuations, which evolved by gravitational collapse and stability um, uh, over billions of years. That's the canonical theory for structure formation. And therefore, they should have left imprints in the radiation field. And so the search began right after the discovery for the fossil fluctuations. Um, it took a very long time. In fact, um, from, uh, you know, uh, for many, many years, this was our current picture of the microwave background, totally smooth. And only when you looked at this with much more precision could you eventually find these elusive fluctuations. And um, so the current state of the art um, is this beautiful map from the Planck satellite named after the founder of quantum theory, Max Planck. Mm. And as you saw, um, we have now fluctuations of a few parts in a million, basically, um, over the sky, slightly hotter, slightly colder. The slightly hot, hotter ones are the denser ones that will give rise to structure eventually. The slightly colder ones will eventually get more and more underdense, give rise to voids in the large scale distribution. And here is the, um, the, 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 the power spectrum that can fit this, uh, this data characterized by angular scale, different on the scale, uh, on the sky, and L is the Fourier harmonic. We look up to Ls of roughly 1,000 or 2,000, um, corresponding to a few arc minutes on the sky. And um, so we can see this wide range of fluctuations. And all of this is fit by, uh, as you heard, just by a very, very simple phenomenological model, which essentially involves just two fundamental parameters and four empirical parameters. And those two fundamental parameters are sort of interesting. They describe the initial conditions. And it's fair to say that the first inflation theories predicted one of these, namely the shape of the spectrum. They didn't predict how strong the fluctuations were. That, that, that's uh, something that we still don't fully understand why they should be what they are is a whole other story. However, um, that's sort of amazing that, that we had just so few numbers dis <coughs> describing these million odd pixels on the sky, um, all that information there. Okay, and again, um, just to give you, uh, again, the cosmic history, the story then. So here we now have, um, from the quantum beginning, um, inflation occurring at something like 10 to the minus 36 seconds. And you'll hear more about that in the next lecture, the hows and whys of that. I'm going to focus more on the predictions. Um, there was a primordial glow and then um, visible on when the universe was just becoming, the fog was clearing, the, the, the universe, the electrons were recombining, the radiation could then um, escape freely to us 13.7 billion years later, and this then is the epoch of structure formation, with an interesting time before the first stars called the Dark Ages, where we see nothing at all, and then structure forms. And so this is sort of our current canonical model of the universe, finally beginning to accelerate. Um, and let me just give you a very simple piece of physical intuition. You'll hear more about this in the next lecture. But the reason the universe began this amazing inflation from almost nothing um, was that um, there was a period where we have an incomplete theory. We still don't understand fully quantum gravity. As the universe cooled down, um, one um, was fully unified with the fundamental forces. And then there came a time when the strong nuclear force um, decoupled from the other forces and um, this was a phase transition and this led to um, a sudden injection of energy uh, much like um, in common language people talk about an analogy with, with, uh, with layers of ice melting basically that releases latent heat this is something similar in some sense this gives rise to an immense expansion briefly which um, leads us to the present enormous universe and so here we have um, 1981 or thereabouts, 
Um, there were three fundamental papers written independently around about the same time, and one of the authors will speak after me, Paul Steinhardt. Um, and this led to um, this, this inflationary prediction that the universe um, uh, should be in very large, and because it becomes briefly so incredibly large, think of it as much like a wrinkled balloon expanding. Locally, the surface becomes incredibly flat. Space is flat, one prediction. Another prediction is used to be very large. Um, um, to under understanding that was one of the outcomes of this. But maybe the most interesting thing of all for us today was that it gave us an incredible way of understanding where these mysterious fluctuations came from that gave rise to structure. And so had it not been for inflation, then as you go back in time, you take some physical scale corresponding to the mass of the galaxy, and here's the horizon expanding the speed of light, then as you go back in time, this, this co-moving scale that contains the mass of the galaxy was once outside the horizon, which means that, you know, when asked to appeal to some mysterious agency, initial conditions or whatever, to explain where these things came from. But thanks to the inflationary theory, it suddenly gave us a new insight that quantum fluctuations could um, produce these and then basically be frozen on very large scales, inflated, and then come back in eventually to be galaxies. So that, that, that was very elegant, very attractive, and has gotten many people's imagination um, working feverishly to understand that better. However, it is still, um, as you will hear from the next speaker, not necessarily without its uh, controversial aspects. And so let me just summarize for you um, the basic predictions. So these I call non-generic in the sense they're very nice predictions, but you know, inflation is a broad framework of many, many theories, and it's hard to say these are generic predictions. Nevertheless, at some point in time, um, you have to stare at all of these predictions, which I'm going to discuss now, and say, well, the balance of the evidence, it's circumstantial evidence, really, the balance of the evidence points to this being a, a reliable theory. Maybe we can't prove it's there, but maybe it's reliable. Anyway, so the flatness of space, okay, that's measured, okay, very precisely. Um, uh, you'll hear more about that in the next talk, too, by, um, especially by the Planck satellite um, and by other types of measurements. That's essentially a, um, a prediction of this enormous... Uh, increase in size by inflation. The enormous size of the observed universe, the density fluctuations, um, which I've talked about, but what about um, aspects that don't work so well? Okay, well, for example, the universe is flat, means it's got a large density that balances the expansion. What is that made of, that density? Well, uh, we first thought it might just all be dark matter. That is not true. We've now measured the dark matter by gravitational lensing. That's a part of it. But the big problem is we haven't identified the dark matter. Big question mark, what is it? So the balance of that missing energy, um, it's not really missing, it's there, to account for the acceleration is what we call dark energy. It's these vacuum fluctuations I mentioned at the beginning. Again, what is that? Um, well, we have a simple theory. It's just Einstein's co Lemaitre's cosmic constant, that that's fine. Um, but we have no fundamental understanding of why that number is as small as it's, uh, as it's found to be. Um, some people argue this is a problem for fundamental physics. Others, and I tend to be in that camp myself, argue, well, it's just another constant of nature. Um, however, let's now move on to specific things that we can do about this to try to get to grips more firmly with inflation. So one is that um, the inflation theory predicts a gravity wave background. I'll explain that again in a moment. And we currently have an upper limit on that um, of uh, the ratio of uh, gravity to scalar perturbations, um, gravity wave to scalar perturbations, and I'll, 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 I'll come back to that. And another one is that, um, uh, and this I think is very important, as you'll see, is that the universe should be um, very uh, much primordially non-Gaussian. Okay, um, in essentially all inflation theories, there should be tiny ripples out there that are not totally Gaussian, that would be tra traces of the beginning. And I'll explain more about that as we go along too. And again, there are just limits on that at the moment. We haven't measured either of these things, but either one will be an amazing triumph. Okay, so let's begin um, with the gravity wave background. Okay, so you imagine now that we're sort of um, looking backwards. Um, here is our last scattering surface. Um, 380,000 years after the Big Bang, and 
imagine a test point over here, an observer over here, his past light cone, another one over here, and if you're more than about a degree on, apart on the sky, then these past light cones don't overlap. So this means you're, that's where you're looking at essentially primordial fluctuations from inflation or from whatever. Okay, so that, that's interesting. And it's on those scales and, and larger scales that you should expect to see some twists and ripples due to this background of gravity waves, which inflation is believed to produce. Okay, and so now I'm not going to get into this detail, you'll get more about that from the next lecture, but basically as inflation occurs, it's shaking up space, it's twisting it a little bit, and this um, uh, leads compression modes, which eventually uh, are the seeds of the galaxies, or rarefaction modes, the seeds of the voids, but also it gives you slight twists, which are the gravity waves. Okay, and so what exactly are these twists? So here is a more specific example of what I mean by a compression mode. We, we call, in, in Maxwellian language as it were, we call them the E and the B modes. Um, uh, that doesn't really matter, but one is a compression mode, one is a twisting mode. And so you're looking for very faint signals on the sky which correspond to these two modes. Now, the compression modes um, that you measure, um, just from structure formation, um, are a few micro Kelvin, and then you can look for the, for, for the compression modes associated with, um, with gravity wave-like distortions, and they're a bit smaller, and they have been detected. But what is really, really elusive are these rarefaction modes, these pure shear modes, no compressions involved, okay? And this is characteristic of a gravity wave passing through space. It shears, basically. And these, unfortunately, are on scales of nano-Kelvin. So you have to do a thousand times better than the current Planck maps to look for these signals. And that is an immense challenge, okay? And that essentially is the entire, one of the most, entire, the most important focuses of, of modern experimental cosmology to look for that. So let me summarize this effort as to be or not to be. Should we be going to be? Now my answer is yes, it would better be to be, but I'm going to try to give you some re reasons for why this is not so easy, okay? So basically, um, you know, we began the story of precision microvacuum cosmology with, with, with Planck, which, um, well, before Planck, W map had around 10 detectors. Planck has 74 detectors, um, and we're looking now to do a thousand times better than Planck, so what do we do? Well, um, uh, moving up in scale, um, um, the Japanese Space Agency is projecting to launch um, Lightbird with European and NASA collaboration, maybe in 2027, that'll have something like a thousand detectors. The more detectors you have, you win by root N, you, you build up your sensitivity to search for these elusive fluctuations. After that, we have the Simons Observatory, now in the next years, um, talking about 35,000 detectors, and then eventually, um, a few years later, we move up to stage four of the CMB with half a million detectors. And so this is where we're finally going to get the precision needed to search for these um, uh, few nano-Kelvin uh, fluctuations. And you can see, um, as you'll hear more about later today, some of these dramatic telescopes that are, um, that are operating already or, and similar ones under construction at the South Pole, the Atacama Desert uh, in Chile, and uh, being launched in uh, long-duration balloons. However, here is the problem. Um, there is no guarantee of any signal in the B mode. Okay, so if you calculate the bottom, the lower limit on this signal, which I said was of order, you know, one part in a thousand of the current one, it could be much, much less. In fact, it depends on when the universe reheats after inflation, and the signal goes to the square, some power of that temperature. And because we don't know when it reheated, it could have reheated fairly recently, you know, you know, before the quark hadron transition, evidently, but really recently, which means that you could have a number as small as 10 to the minus 40. Now, no experimentalist in their right mind would dream of looking for that. You can do 10 to the minus 3, maybe something 10 to the minus 4, but below that, it's bad, okay? And so the trouble is, again, so what do you do? So I, I think one, one has to do only one thing. One has to look, okay? Maybe we'll be lucky, but bear in mind that we may not be lucky, okay? So here is... The other approach, then, I said there were gravity waves. Now let's turn to non-Gaussianity. So I want to focus on primordial non-Gaussianity. Th so these, these twists and turns in the primordial fluctuations uh, are a robust prediction of inflationary models, actually. Um, um, well, the trouble is our universe is very non-Gaussian. We're here. We're very non-Gaussian, okay? If you look at the, a simulation of, of, of galaxies, so here is... Um, 
uh, an actual simulation of galaxy clustering with the famous cosmic web. And here you see the same power but randomly shuffled, and here it is. Okay? So th this is Gaussian, this is non-Gaussian. So clearly our universe is highly non-Gaussian, and that's why we're here. But how on earth do you separate this non-Gaussian from whatever is underneath in those initial fluctuations? That's the trouble. And here is an, you know, okay, those have the same power. Okay, so here's another example of non-Gaussianity. Um, so here, from this picture of the W map sky, if you look very carefully, you can see strange features there. So let me blow up one of them. And um, so it's hard to tell, actually, but um, uh, this looks like, a, well, a, a, an H, actually, anyway, and there's an S next to it, so whatever. So people point to this and say, this is a weird example of, um, you know, uh, um, non-Gaussianity, and of course, uh, it's a, it was a great loss to lose Stephen Hawking, but, you know, it wouldn't be wonderful if his name were in the sky, but that, of course, is... <coughs> okay, anyway, so non-Gaussianity. Um, okay, so let me try to give you this in as few words as possible. Imagine I have some fluctuations... Um, and then if I take, imagine that um, whatever gave rise to them, there are higher order components which go as, say, the square of those fluctuations. Even the fluctuations are Gaussian, the square is non-Gaussian. So that, that's fundamental. And so it turns out that the generic prediction of inflation is a component of fluctuations, which are delta t over t, which go as the square and have a small number multiplying that square. So not only is the square smaller than, you know, the, the fluctuations by... by a significant factor, but we now have a small number times that. So this is why it's so difficult. So what is that small number? Well, it turns out to be um, very easy to calculate in a fundamental way. So NS is the index, is the shape of the fluctuation spectrum, which is measured precisely to many sigma now by Planck. And I just take this, this, this number, and I take one away from it, and I get this, this value of FNL. This ought to be 0.03. And if you do the calculations in gory detail, y this number's a bit uncertain. It could be a bit lower than 0.03, it could be 0.01. But whatever, um, or maybe even less than that, but there's a number there which is predicted by all models, okay, as far as, I, as, far as, as, as the experts tell us of inflation. Okay, so the trouble is, we're looking for 0.01 or whatever, but what we have currently is 10. Okay, so th the problem is that the current limit from Planck and from any other surveys, but CMB, Rocket Falcon is the best, is around 10. So we have to do a thousand times better. And that's tough. And that's something that you can never do with the CMB, microwave background. So here's why. Because with microwave background, you have at most around a million pixels, a million degrees of freedom, a million modes on the sky. L is a thousand, the square of the harmonic is the number of modes, basically, maybe 2,000 squared, whatever. And that means the square root of n, which is 0.1%, is you can never do better than 0.1% precision cosmology. You're stuck there. You'll never get there. Okay, so um, the next step is to go for large-scale structure. Okay, so this is the, the future in the next few years, parallel to the CMB. One shouldn't give up on the CMB, obviously, but if you want to do better, this may be the way to go. And suddenly, you now have surveys like LSST coming along with 20 billion photometric redshifts. You have enormous numbers of modes of degrees of freedom on the sky. The trouble is galaxies are rather complicated things. So at the end of the day, you'll be lucky if you get 100 million modes. But that's great. That's 100 times better than the CMB. That means you can do 10 times better in measuring FNL, which is wonderful. So they've got from 10 to 1, okay? But that's not, not good enough either. So there is just one way to do this, okay? And that is to go to the dark ages, I'll explain what this is in a second, where I have many, many clouds for every galaxy before the galaxy is formed, and they give me many, many more modes. And because I might have as many as, who knows, a million, each cloud is thought to be a million, so the most I might have as many as a million clouds per galaxy, I suddenly open up mode space. It's amazing, right? I can suddenly get up to 10 to the 12th or more, and I can now talk about, you know, accuracies that will get me down to pro pro really fundamentally doing inflation. And I will sh show you that maybe we're talking about the time frame of 2040 for this, but this could be the future. Okay, so to summarize quickly, the Dark Ages. Why is this such an inc incredible thing to do? Because you have this wonderful frequency from the transition of atomic hydrogen, the hyperfine structure. Um, you excite and de-excite, and you can produce um, absorption, um, 
against a submicrograde background, that's the best way to do this, um, at, at this very well-known frequency, 1400 megahertz. Now, of course, you want to do this in the dark ages. Here is the microwave background. Here is all the structure forming today. We now want to look in this region before the structure's formed. We have no contamination from non gaussianity from structure formation. We're looking at pristine stuff, which should be a snapshot of the beginning. So that's the idea. Um, and um, why is this so incredibly powerful? Well, here it is. Here is all you can ever do, all we have done with the microwave background. This is our famous power spectrum with the first peak and the, and the, and the damping away of the power. That's all you can get to L of a thousand, a million modes. That's it. That's the end. But if you can open up the new space in the dark ages, then suddenly you can get down to, um, you know, effective harmonics of 10 to the fifth or whatever. And so you can suddenly open up billions of modes, trillions of modes. This is a way to get trillions of modes, okay? And root of square of that gives you one over square of gives you your accuracy. This is the way um, for the future, I think. Uh, it's not going to be easy. Um, but we have the first step that's been taken just a few weeks ago. And so here is a, sig a dipole antenna, simple dipole, in, in the Australian, middle of nowhere in the Australian desert, okay, which radio quiet, um, the edges experiment, looking at 75 me me megahertz. Um, okay, um, so, and they uh, found f absorption against the microwave background. Now, a redshift 17 even, now, the experiment is still controversial, has yet to be confirmed, but this is the beginning. That this is just you know, a single, it's a global signal. We're not looking at fine scale structure, but it shows you in principle there is something to be probed. Now, where you want to go, so this is where they measured um, what we call cosmic dawn. They're being um, uh, essentially crowded in from two sides by the formation of structure, heating up the gas, and by the decoupling from, from the CMB, the coupling then destroying the signal too, so you have a, a window there of absorption. But in principle, if you can go back even earlier, okay, you have this, this is the temperature um, of the hydrogen, the spin temperature. You, you, you can see that it's, um, it's lower than the CMB, it's the radiation. So there's a sweet spot back here, which, wait for it, is at redshift 50, okay? So you've got to observe at 30 megahertz, okay? Now that's a tough place to do astronomy, and there's only one place we can get this accuracy that you need, and it's a bit far away, but you know maybe we'll get there someday, and that's the far side of the moon. Okay, so um, so then let's just uh, see what I'm going to end by showing you what the future has in store um, for us in this direction. Okay, so here is uh, an old um, idea from some more than 10 years ago from J J JPL actually, a, co a concept study, going to the far side of the moon and laying down um, a series of dipoles. Um, these would be um, possibly 3D printed metal dipoles or mylar strips um, covering hundreds of kilometers of the lunar surface. So this is what you need to do. It's really, it's really futuristic. Um, you're, you're discussing um, you know, wavelengths of 10 meters, um, you, you need to get, do 100 times better than the CMB resolution, the L10 to the fifth. That means you need an array 100 kilometers across. You need millions of dipoles, and you're looking for a 10 millik signal. Okay, um, so it's not an easy experiment to do, but we're getting there on the ground. This is the SKA, square kilometer array. In a few years' time, we'll have 100,000 dipoles. So the numbers don't scare us, okay? But you can't do this from Australia because of the ionosphere, which is a killer and all the interference from communications on the Earth. So the moon is great. So let me finish by telling you that not only do you want to go to the moon to do radio astronomy, but it's a great place to do microwave astronomy too, okay? And in particular, um, it's the ultimate experiment. If ever you want to put an interferometer uh, to study the, to do a, a, a real set of measurement of distortions from the CMB, this might be a good place to go. Okay, and so uh, looking at the south, the South Pole is a great place to be. There are these, all these craters around, which are dark and very cold. So the Shackleton Crater, for example, um, is a, an interesting place. Um, you notice the rims, which are four kilometers high, in perpetual sunlight. Um, the, the, this is 20 kilometers across in perpetual darkness and perpetual cold as well. As measured by the NASA Diviner spacecraft, it's 30 Kelvin in there, okay? So it's a great place, um, these are thermal images, to do infrared, far infrared astronomy. And um, one could imagine in the future um, doing telescopes there. Okay, so um, when are we going to um, 
go back um, to the moon. Okay, the Chinese are there already. This is the current US presence on the moon. Um, but things will change rapidly. Um, this is what um, the Europe wants, ESA wants to do. So their, their boss has announced that we'll be building a, a moon village, permanent lunar base by the end of the next decade. Business and tourism were his ma major ideas, but we think telescopes should be a good thing too. And now we have the US presence uh, coming along as well, okay? So, and this may happen also. Um, and it, partly, you know, it's because we have a Chinese project up there already, and the Chinese will go back, that's for sure, are going back next year, in fact. And so, you know, I think things are really moving along, and I think it's time that we dis discussed putting telescopes on the moon. Um, but, you know, this is no competition with current resources, because this is in the future. Way in the future, we're discussing 2040. Just to summarize then, for the future of cosmology, um, with the CMB, um, we're really stuck with the million modes, which means your precision, 1 over n, is 0.1%. Um, we must go on for B, no question about that, and we, if we're lucky, we'll find it. Um, if you want to do better, then the next step is to use the galaxy surveys. You can do 100 times better in modes. That means 10 times better in precision. And there's enormous amounts of collateral information you get from galaxy surveys. So there's no question that's highly justified too on evolution of galaxies and all that stuff. But if you actually want to test inflation and do the most robust test possible, okay, then you'd better go, I think, to study these first clouds. You have this enormous increase in the number of modes, and that means the moon. So thank you. <coughs>